Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You are listening to Your Money Momentum. My name is Tom Kennedy, and I have my trusty sidekick, Kevin Curley, over here. Thanks, Tom. Happy to be happy to be here. Be uh, the Robin to you your like Batman. Yeah. Was, did Superman uh, have a henchman or a number two? I don't think he did. I don't think he did. That's so right. let's kick it off. We got our mid-month podcast. We are going to start with a topic on college grads and what they should do after college. Uh, we're going to go into headlines and then Nostra Thomas is making a comeback this episode and we will finish with our, uh, our mail grab. So let's jump into it and talk about our first topic in regards to college grads. What's your, what's your advice, Kevin, for those clients who have, who have children that are about to graduate or just graduated what do you think? Yeah, uh, well, specifically, I wanted to talk about kind of getting their career started. The Financial Times had a whole guide to basically new graduates of how to start your first job, what a career's like, all those things. And so uh, the questions that I think everybody wonders is, you know, what do you wear to work? What time should you get there? How should you act at work? Uh, <laughs> do you bring your whole self to work? And how do you build a career? So I'd start with, Tom, what time do you show up for work? Not well, specific time. I was but early, late. late I was start from your employees. I, I was always told if if you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. So I would, and I, you know, when I started my career in the finance industry, I was always I turned the lights on and turned the lights off. I just got to work early. I wanted to be the first one there, and I wanted to be the last one to leave, whether I had stuff to do or not. You know, first impressions are everything, and you know, top management, upper management tends to see that. And as far as you know, what you, what you wear to work. I mean, you want to dress to impress first impressions, like I said, are, are everything. And I think you want to go above and beyond when it comes to, those are two things that are very easy to do. So why not do them? Yeah. The, what time to get there? I've always heard the top employees. So you're, we'll use letter grades since the recent graduates, your A level uh, employees, they get there early, they stay late, your B level. So your average employees, they get there on time, they leave on time and your C level employees, well, they show up late and they always want to leave early. So you got to decide what kind of employee you want to be. Tends to happen that the A employees get the raises, get the promotions, and the C employees go find somewhere else to work. So that would be the first takeaway. As far as what to wear, it's changed a lot. Uh, when I first started in finance, I wore a suit and tie every day. Uh, I see some people in the hallway who are still doing that, but most of them have dropped the tie at least. I would say you just got to figure out what the culture of your office is. If you're working in Silicon Valley and you're wearing Hawaiian shirts and flip flops, great. If you're in finance and you're on Wall Street, yeah, suit up. I, you know, I think it's, yeah, it obviously depends on the sector. Um, so we won't go into actual outfits, but I think one hygiene, you know, I can't tell you many people <laughs> like just don't shower the, the morning before. What about shaving shower at night? plucking your eyebrows? I, mean, you want to, I think you just want to be, you just want to have good hygiene. You want to be clean, clean shaved, especially for the first first week or two until you figure out what the culture is and, and what it's like. But I just think you want to go above and beyond when it comes to all that. Um, get a fresh haircut, you know, cut your nails, don't look like a slob and uh, you, sh you should do well. But again, depending on what the occupation is, they're all, they're all very different. I can tell you anything in the finance world. Um, that's it. Yeah. Finance. I always was told, you know, you don't want what you're wearing to be a distraction from the message you're bringing. So if you're going to go meet with clients or meet with a boss or somebody like that, you don't want them to be looking at the design on your tie. You want them to be listening to what you're saying. So simple white shirt, black suit, Navy suit, gray suit, uh, pretty straightforward and, you know, keep it pretty simple and look around the office and say, okay, that's what people wear here. Uh, I got that. Tom, what about uh, politics, religion? Definitely bring those to your first day of work and strike up conversations in the uh, water cooler and in the break room, right? 
Yeah. I mean, listen, I used to lean left and right, depending on who I was talking to. I just wanted to get ahead. I didn't care what, what, what they, whatever they needed me to, to feel or say, I did it. Um, <laughs> no, I think, you know, I think, I think you stay neutral. I think it depends on, it depends on the sector and the, and the industry, but, uh, I, you want to do your homework. I think you want to learn about the company. You want to, in my opinion, how I always thought about it is when I first started my first job, I say to myself, no one's thinking or no one's sitting around right now thinking, how am I going to get Tom Kennedy moved up in the world, you know, besides me? So how am I going to go above and beyond? How am I going to get the attention of upper management? And I think it's just showing a level of commitment and motivation and drive and just that you care. I mean, everything else can be taught. It's you're not supposed to you're not supposed to you're not expected to know everything the first day of work, but you know, you're expected to have some drive and some passion and to do not just punch a ticket and and come in in the morning and, and leave at night. Stay, stay the extra hours, talk to, you know, your superiors or others and and learn more about, you know, whatever your specific job is. Yeah, the Financial Times described your career as a mountain. And so plan your first steps. I think that what you're talking about is exactly that, the first steps. And I think a follow up to that is when you're in the elevator and let's say there's somebody else in there, you know, don't be afraid to introduce yourself politely. I mean, if they're on the phone, don't interrupt them. But if you're going to ride up 10 floors, you got, you know, 20 seconds or so. Hey, Tom, I've seen you around the office. I'm Kevin. I work here now. I'm the new intern, as an analyst, associate, whatever it is. It's a good way to meet the other people in the office. And, you know, somebody might put their arm around Tom and say, you know, I met this kid in the elevator. He seems like a hustler. How do we get him a little more opportunity? Uh, so that that would be a good first step for sure is meet the other people in the office and uh, try to get them to think, how do I help this person? And showing that you care is a great way. Like like my man JC said, you can never knock a hustler. Everyone loves a hustler. So it's just... <laughs> Kids these days, I don't know if there's any work. Can't knock it's just, <laughs> yeah, well, same thing. You know what I mean. <laughs> uh, All right. Well, should we move on to the headlines? Yeah, let's move on to the headlines. Leaving no stone unturned, it's time for headlines and the news you may have missed. So, First Republic failed two weeks ago. What are your thoughts there? This is the third bank making it, putting the market cap of the failed regional banks just over $500 billion. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, there was no real reaction in the stock market. In fact, JP Morgan stock rose after they won the auction. So apparently the first round, the bids weren't good enough. So they limited the pool and said, okay, the top bidders, you know, try again. And, you know, there's kind of a multi-step process here compared to what happened with SVP. Um, in the sense that JP Morgan acquired them after they kind of went into receivership. And so JP Morgan was responsible for backing up all the depositors, as opposed to in the Silicon Valley Bank, the Fed was actually the one who stepped in and the Treasury and said, we'll back all the depositors. So it was very different in the sense that this wasn't really a bailout or a depositor bailout, I think what they called the SVP implosion. So it was kind of working together, but really it was kind of a private sector takeout. Uh, it's way different. I mean, the stockholders got wiped out, bondholders got wiped out in both sets, but everybody was kind of made whole and JP Morgan's got a much bigger franchise now. So the biggest bank in the country just got bigger. Yeah. And let's put this in, in perspective. So this was the, the biggest out of the three that fell. They were 213 billion roughly in total assets. They had a hundred billion in deposits. That was at their peak. That was at their peak. Leave. At, at, at their peak, right. They had a hundred billion in deposits leave. Mm -hmm. um, their paper losses. So again, I know we talked about this on that one, on our one podcast, but the the big reason when we had this run is that the collateral to back it, the treasuries, what they were invested in just got just, got killed in unrealized losses. So they had to lock in those losses to mm -hmm. meet the redemptions. They had, as of the end of December, they had 4.8 billion in paper losses. Um, put that in perspective, it was 53 million a year earlier. So now I read an interesting article in, in the in the Financial Times about this, which I didn't know. That, that discount window um, that the Fed put out there, that short-term window to lend these banks some credit if they needed it to, to make depositors whole, they counted about 72% of them. So, you know, they think that this may have been the weakest link out of all of them. Um, I, I don't know if there's going to be more out there to, to, that are going to come, you know, come, come to the top. Um, 
but I think this might have been the, the weakest link out of out of the three. Yeah, it's interesting, the political part of it. So the head of the Financial Services Committee said that there was great work by the regulators. Meanwhile, Elizabeth Warren was very critical, said the problem was that uh, it's a poorly supervised bank. And I would take issue with that. And the reason why is that the regulators are the one who changed the rules and led to a lot of these unrealized losses. So they gave preferential treatment if you held a lot of treasuries or especially government mortgage-backed securities on the books and were much more punitive when it came to, we'll call it release rates, for commercial loans. And those are typically floating rate or variable rate. And so when these interest rates went up, they didn't have any commercial loans as far as you know size compared to the treasury. So they had a huge unrealized losses, which you alluded to, but the regulators, the one who told them, you guys should buy all these treasuries and mortgage backed securities, you know, commercial banks, especially the regional ones, they never said we want to do that. They're in the business of lending out money. And so it was a very odd situation where you had the regulators then take them out after telling them to buy these and telling them to do less in commercial loans. So uh, I think government might be the problem here. Yeah, no, I don't disagree with you. And, and by the way, JP Morgan, it's expected they're going to make on this deal about $500 million annually in profit going forward outside of the immediate, you know, one time that fee that they had, they had to pick up. But, you know, it's not just the shareholders that are absorbing the losses. The FDIC is absorbing, I think it's right around $13 billion in losses um, from First Republic. Put that in perspective, uh, Silicon Valley was about $20 billion. So, you know, the FDIC insurance to these banks is going to go up across the board because they're just getting killed right now um, in losses that, they're, that they have to absorb in these bad loans and mortgages. Yeah, I thought the, the takeaway from Jamie Dimon basically – not puffing his chest out, but defending the acquisition. He said, you need large, successful banks. And anyone who thinks that it would be good for the U.S. not to have that should call me directly. And he pointed out that they bank most major cities, most major countries, most major school districts, et cetera, et cetera. It's like they are a big bank and they're going to be around. Um, and it's interesting that Too Big to Fail allowed them to get even bigger. And look, it's well run. They have the Fortress balance sheet idea and all that. But yeah, I mean... It's going to make them even yeah. bigger than they were. Nope. I agree. Uh, okay. Let's move on to uh, the next article that you had put out here. The reason the pros don't beat the market, they can't beat you. What are your thoughts there? <laughs> so this is the old, can the professionals outperform the market? Can the retail outperform the market? Can they beat the index and so forth? So, Jason Zweig, who writes a column called The Intelligent Investor, he loves to go after fees being the biggest problem. And look, they're a factor. It's always something that should be a consideration. But um, he pointed out that if you're an index, you have to be always fully invested. If you're an individual, you can pick and choose your spots. If you're a professional manager, you have a mandate that might be uh, a subset of the overall market. And so he just said, basically, you know, the pros can't beat you because you can ditch the 1% annual expenses, you can ditch the mutual funds, and you can just go do it yourself. I think that ignores the emotional part. But um, it's, uh, I think it's very misleading to say the pros, or rather, the individual investors can beat the pros, because well, I know a lot of people who got uh, killed. Uh, think of the GameStop stuff and all those I just uh, no, I think this are, I think this article is so ridiculous on, on every, in every way. First off, you look at the average retail investor's return over the last forty years; it's under three percent. Um, where the S and P's, you know, call it seven and eight. We've all seen those numbers, um, and they're real. And the reason being is you just said it is emotions. The individual retail investor cannot take the emotion out of it. Um, I mean, you know, I can't sometimes. It's it's very difficult to to manage your own money, and you also have to define pros. <laughs> I mean, <Yeah. laughs> you know, you have hedge funds, you have individual money managers, you have mutual funds, you have ETFs. So, I think it's uh, and to your point with what we saw with the crypto craze and the meme stocks, and look how that all ended and is ending as we speak. So, yeah, I don't I don't agree with this with this, uh, with his article. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you look at some of the hedge fund guys and some of the advice that some of the best traders of all time, and this is from the book market wizards, you know, Jason's why exists in here, you know, limit yourself to a handful of possibilities, never put more than 5% of your money into, you know, one idea basically, and don't add new money, even if they go up. 
Uh, many professional money managers would not tell you to do that. They would tell you, you know, concentrate a basket of stocks or you put 5%, then you keep adding, especially as it goes up. And you look at some companies that have done well over time, and we won't name any specifics because we're not allowed to, but if you just kept adding or how about reinvesting dividends, your compound of returns are going to be way better than if you said 5%, that's it, give me the cash and dividends. So I, I just, <laughs> he is a frustrating guy because he has a big mouthpiece and he just kind of says the same thing over again. Yeah, you know, I, I think the one advantage, you know, the, the individual or retail investor has is size. And it could be a disadvantage as well. Size is that, that meaning they can be nimble. They can move around. You know, if you have $100,000 and you want to buy into a stock, no one's going to notice. But if you have, if you're running a $400 billion hedge fund and you want to take a stake in a stock, um, you got to put a decent amount to, to move the needle. Um, so I think there's, but then, then they being also nimble, get, right. That's where retail it, advantage it, could exist. And a lot of that's correct. It's, it's, it's being, it's, it's being nimble, but they also get like, look at Warren Buffett, you know, getting preferreds on some stocks like bank of America, because he's got such a big stake that he's getting pricing concessions. So being big and being small, both have their, their pros and cons, but, um, I well, think even his like all. Occidental deal, right? He gets paid dividends in stock, and so he just acquired yep. more and more of the company. So there are preferential treatment right. for the pros, right? Yep, yep. All right, enough of that garbage. Let's go see Let's our buddy on. Nostra Thomas. And now, we ask our soothsayer to gaze into his crystal ball. Let's hear from the alchemist himself, Nostra Thomas. 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 All right, Shoot. Nostra Thomas, welcome back. It's been a long time, but we're happy to see you again. Uh, we're going to start with colleges. This is a little bit of a theme since it's May, but according to the College Board, uh, which is a website, keeps all kinds of data, uh, after a decade of decline, declining number of students, the fees for U.S. college private universities are falling. That makes three years in a row. Now, Mr. Thomas, where does college tuition costs go from here? Is this unique to private schools or is tuition coming down everywhere? Well, if you leave it to uh, a certain party uh colleges are going to be free anyway in two years but if it's <laughs> not college costs i think will have to continue to come down to your point they've been coming down the last three years i think a four-year uh private college was right around forty-three thousand a year, is where it's peaked and it's now under 40. listen they're like any other you know for-profit uh business they they have to make money and if you're if your end client, your students are dropping, which they have to your point over the last 10 years and they're probably continuing to go down. Um, one of the reasons for that decline is because of the cost and because of the debt burden. So I think this will be a continued trend. I think it needs to be a continued trend. I think we have a structural issue right now when you look at just how much debt is out there with these college kids when they get out and the inflation rate on college in general over the last 20, 30 years. Um, it, it just can't keep up at this pace. So, and a quick, quick stat, there was a study done that 78% of college students would prefer to do college online if it was for, if it was at a cheaper cost. That's pretty interesting. I'm, I'm curious to know if the declining numbers are just because Gen Z is smaller population wise than the millennials, or if there's something more there. I think there? it was part of it, but I think also technology and, and having more competition with the online providers um, is also playing a role. Great. All right, no, Sir Thomas. So we talked in a previous episode how April was very quiet. The VIX is at the lowest since 2021, despite the second and third largest bank failures in U.S. history, a debt ceiling showdown where the U.S. may default in a couple of weeks, and a war in Europe. Uh, no, Sir Thomas, how low... Will the VIX go from here or how high will it go from here? So I, let me explain what the VIX is for those that don't understand. The VIX, also known as the fear gauge in the market, uh, and it's spelled V-I-X. It basically gauges the volatility that the market has on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's a long calculation that goes into it. We won't get into it for this, but a simple way to look at the VIX is the rule of 16. So you divide by 16. So if the VIX is at 16, which just coincidentally it is today, then you can expect a move of 1% in the market. 16 divided by 16 is one. So that's what you can experience volatility wise in the market. If the VIX was at 32, 
you could experience a 2% swing in the market. Um, and, and it's pretty, it's pretty accurate. It's not an exact science, but as the VIX goes up, you tend to have a lot more volatility, uh, in the market. And listen, all of last year, not all of last year, but a good portion of last year, we were above 30 on the VIX. You had these 2% swings, 2017, you could barely go to get over 12 on, on, on the VIX. So I think the VIX goes a lot higher from here. I think we'll, we'll see it a north of 30 with some more volatility this year. Um, and I don't think it gets much lower than where we're at right now. Great. Thank you, Nosha Thomas. Uh, the next segment will tie to the VIX by saying, if you look at the chart of Beyond Meat and you look at the chart of VIX, uh, they both used to be a lot higher and now are a lot lower. <laughs> if you look specifically at the fake meat stock, uh, it was a hot fad for a while, but it has created since the all-time highs in 2019. Now, um, lab-grown meat and meat made in tanks that's not really even meat, but proteins being turned into meat, very strange stuff, very sci-fi, uh, is making waves and making its rounds. Nostra Thomas, what's the future of cows and what's the future of fake meat? Yeah, you know, I had a... <laughs> I saw this one and I had to read into it a little bit. Uh, the only thing lab grown that I'm going to be buying is diamonds anytime soon. I mean, <laughs> they are a tenth of the cost and they're almost flawless, but we won't tell my wife that. I don't think, I think this is a fad. <laughs> First off, you know, they're two different, two different things, but kind of in the same, same, you know, uh, the same consumer is purchasing these these items, in, in my opinion. You had Beyond Meat, which was vegan and vegetarian that's supposed to taste like meat. Um, and that didn't go too well because, you know, there's been a ton of research out there that this stuff is actually um, – eating the actual meat itself is more healthy than, than eating some of this, some of this fake meat. Uh, the lab-grown meat is actual meat where <laughs> they have to literally get cells from, you know, either living animals or eggs and – uh, and grow them. And I think I just don't, I don't see how this is going to, this is going to take off. The, the only reason I think the only target population you're, you're going after are people that are vegetarians only because they love animals. So that's kind of what this cures in my opinion. Um, but there's just no way that this takes off. There's, there was an article again, the financial times put out about just, there's three highly capital, uh, costs associated with this stuff. It's the facility is making them big enough and sterile enough to uh, prevent bacteria growth. Two, sourcing the amino acids and other ingredients for the cell culture. And then three, growing the cells at a high enough density to achieve price parity with buying actual meats. So yeah, I don't think there's enough, a big enough demographic um, out there that's going to catch on to this unless the prices are just so much lower than real meat i don't think it has any legs yeah i think if it was space travel and you had it as like your bridge meat until you got to mars and were able to get cows on mars maybe it makes sense but uh that's uh it's gonna take a while before i have a what is uh, this, fake meat burger. what does this do to the food chain too if no one's eating actual animals anymore are they just gonna start I, to just there seems you know, to be people I, are out to get the cows uh off the earth which is uh I don't know. Maybe we'll have cow space travel, but let's move into the, the final question for Nostra Thomas. Uh, KRE is a regional bank index. If you look at the chart, uh, it, it looks like a toddler grabbed the crayon and just drew a straight line down. It, it kind of fell off a cliff. Uh, so I ask you, and this is a song, but you know, are regional banks about to be somebody that we used to know? <laughs> no, I think it's, uh, you're going to naturally see a massive sell-off with the regional banks based on three banks um, going belly up. Also, you had a ton of short interest on these ETFs and the banks in general. So a lot would argue a lot of this sell-off is just from people and hedge funds shorting these banks um, day after day. And you have you see a ton of short interest right now across the ETFs and the individual banks themselves. Uh, but I do think there could be, you know, there could be some more pain. You know, you look at, you look at the regional banks right now, you know, they represent about 70% of the commercial real estate loans out there, um, which is, you know, a five and a half trillion dollar market. And a lot of those loans are maturing or not a lot, but there's a good amount that are maturing this year They're going to be maturing at higher rates. And just like we we're talking about earlier, you know, office space is, is big with, 
not many people going back to the office still. So I think commercial real estate's in trouble. And unfortunately, the smaller banks, the regional banks versus the big banks have a lot of exposure to it. So I think that could be the next shoe to drop um, for, in the banking crisis, which would put a lot of pressure on on KRE. But I don't think it's I don't think it's justified just yet that big that big price drop that we saw um, from just really a, a handful of banks selling off. All right. Thank you, Nostra Thomas. Let's go check the mailbag. It's time to hear from listeners as we open the mailbag and answer your questions. All right. So mail time, board games. We had uh, a lot of board games take off during COVID with everyone had nothing to do. Um, What is your favorite board game, Kevin? Yeah, if I had the patience and the time and the right players, I would play Risk uh, all day, <laughs> all day long. But it takes you know a couple of days to play a game, especially if you have good competitors. So I am a big fan of Monopoly, and if you can play it in a few hours, it's a blast. I play with my son, who I think we first started playing when he was five, uh, maybe even four. Uh, so we had to have a little bit of help. But you know, they learn to count money, they learn to do math. Uh, well, I guess that's the same thing, but learn to add and subtract by tens, uh, improve property, real estate, the factor of luck and chance. So I'm, I'm number one, uh, board game is definitely a monopoly. How about you? Yeah, not, not a big, uh, not a big fan of board games. Um, Monop- I like monopoly, but I, I like cards better. And there's a ton of card games that it came out, especially during COVID. A lot of the meme games and more of, more of the drinking games, I would say, um, <laughs> I, I enjoy a lot. Maybe I, you know, cause I don't have kids. I, I can't share the same, uh, enthusiasm and passion with, uh, you know, it, for monopoly as you do, but yeah, yeah we're I, got, <laughs> I got two suggestions on board games. Um, two that got real popular during the pandemic. One is it'll make you laugh. The other one is an old game that got rejuvenated. It's called Catan, which I've never played, but apparently it was great. The other one they had is called pandemic legacy. It's a game in which all players try to collaborate to contain a virus and <laughs> eradicate it from the game. Uh, I'm told it's a little bit like watching the show uh, Last of Us, but I don't know. That, that seems like something we'd all rather forget than play a board game of. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was that was a good one. Um, all right, last one. Wall Street Journal just had an article about laddering CDs. What is a ladder? How do they work? And what are some options? How do I go about it if this is a, if this is a strategy that I'm thinking about implementing? Yeah, ladders are basically just buying the same type of product in different maturities. So, for example, if you had a CD and you had a hundred thousand dollars, and you said, "Well, I want to put it all in to CDs." Okay, great. Go, what's the best time? Uh, one year, two year, five year, and so forth. Uh, the reason you want a ladder is to limit your reinvestment risk and you can take advantage of current rates. And if rates go up, you have one maturing a year from now, you can reinvest at higher rates. If rates go down, you have some longer rates so or longer terms like four and five years. And that way, when you reinvest at a lower rate, you're still getting the higher returns. So it's a way to diversify your maturity uh, on products that are fixed income. So CDs is a good example treasury bonds, as well as the inflation linked I bonds. Yeah, no laddering has been around for years. It hasn't been as popular. I would call it the last decade just because rates have been so low. So no one's been focusing on CDs or bonds, but now with rates at where they're at, you know, the big question we get about CDs or even bonds, well, do I buy one that that matures in one year or five year or 10 years or three years? And to your point, you kind of just ladder out each year. So each year you have one of those maturing because like you said, you don't know if the rate you're going to get in the market two or three years from now is going to be higher or lower. So you just spread out your risk a little bit. Um, it allows you to have those bonds or CDs mature and you can get that cash and then you can go do something else with it, or you can continue to buy more CDs and more and more bonds. It's a great, it's a great, uh, strategy for, you know, the right individual. And like I said, with, with interest rates as high as they are right now, um, they can make they can make a lot of sense in this environment. Yeah, and look, I think predicting interest rates is <laughs> just as challenging as predicting who's going to win the Super Bowl or who's going to win, 
you know, what's the best stock to own, that type of thing. And so having a ladder in which you're taking a piece and dividing it up, I think it's the best way to kind of diversify across time frames. And you don't have to limit yourself to CDs. I mean, treasuries in some cases are yielding higher. They have less penalties. I bonds have a factor uh, that are different, so it can be more valuable. So you could take a blend of all of them and you can have a really, really interesting fixed income portfolio for sure. Nope, that's good. I like it. Well, that's a wrap uh, for this mid-month podcast. Any questions that you have or any topics you want to hear, you can shoot us an email at info at gwadvisors.net, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks for our month-end podcast. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Tom. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.